Okay, and then we're going to integrate our equation right here with separation of variables. So what we'll do is we'll write dp is equal to negative rho g dz. We'll integrate both sides of that equation. And we'll remember that since we're dealing with an incompressible isothermal fluid and a constant gravitational field, the product rho times g is constant, so we could pull that out of the integral. So we'll have p is equal to negative rho g times the quantity z plus some integration constant. Since rho g is constant, we could simply distribute it to this sum, and then k becomes another integration constant. So we could say that is equal to negative rho g z plus k2. Now, the way we solve for this integration constant is through a boundary condition. So if we have some reference level at which we know the pressure, we could say at z is equal to z naught, p is equal to p naught. We'll write p naught is equal to negative rho g z naught plus k2. K2 is equal to p naught plus rho g z naught. And then we can substitute that back into the original equation. So we have p is equal to negative rho g z plus p naught plus rho g z naught. Now the way that this is usually expressed is p is equal to p naught plus the product rho times g times z naught minus z. So traditionally, this equation is actually written in terms of a distance. So what we could say is if we have a free surface, let's say this is the free surface right here, and we'll say this is z naught, and at z naught, our pressure is p naught, and we have some point of interest down here, which we'll call z, at which the pressure is p, we have some distance h, right? So what exactly does that mean? That means that if we establish our z coordinate as positive up, at the free surface, then this difference right here will have p equals p naught plus rho g zero minus z. z in this case is below the free surface, it is below the origin, so z is negative. z is always negative when you define z as positive up originating at the free surface. So in that case, we could just say that since z is always negative in this setup, we could say that that is equal to p naught plus rho g h. Again, this expression of the hydrostatic pressure equation completely depends on z being positive upwards, which we already know is required from a previous part of the analysis, and originating at the free surface of the fluid that we care about, right? Because when the coordinate system originates at the free surface, the point of interest is always negative point of interest is always negative. So z is always negative. So in this expression up here, we have zero minus z, z is always negative. So this is always a positive number. This difference is always a positive number. So we might as well just use the distance from the free surface h, where h is always a positive number, and h is the distance down from the free surface to the point of interest. So this is actually the final form of our hydrostatic pressure equation, and we will write the formalism for it on the next page, and then we can actually start using it to solve some fluid statics problems. So analyzing u 2 manometers, sphygmo manometers, inclined tube manometers, compound manometers, etc. So let's go into the next page, establish the formalism, and then go from there. Okay, so here's the formalism for our final version of the hydrostatic pressure equation. We'll note that P is the pressure at depth H from the free surface. P naught is the reference pressure or the pressure at the free surface. H is the distance down from the free surface to the point of interest. H is a distance, so it's always positive. Rho is the density of the fluid, and G is the magnitude of gravitational acceleration, so G is also always positive. So here we have our diagram on the right. We have our free surface at which the pressure is P naught. We have our depth H down from the free surface to the point of interest where the pressure is P. The coordinate axes originate at the free surface, and Z is positive upwards, and G is downwards, acting parallel but opposite to Z. So again, some of our fundamental assumptions for this equation. One, we're dealing with a static fluid. Two, gravity is the only body force. Three, the z-axis, or k-hat, is positive vertical, opposite but parallel to gravity, as shown here. Four, we have an isothermal and incompressible fluid such that rho is constant. Five, g is constant. The magnitude of acceleration due to gravity is constant. And six, the axes originate at the free surface, as shown here. So z equals zero is the free surface, and z, again, is positive up.
So as I mentioned previously, this equation is incredibly powerful and we will get a lot of use out of it over the course of our fluid studies. So in fluid statics, it is the starting point for most analyses. And even in fluid dynamics, we use it in a few derivations and we use it as a point of reference. So this equation is one of the fundamental equations of fluid dynamics, and we will see it a lot over the course of this study. Keep in mind what the variables stand for. Keep in mind some of the fundamental assumptions. Keep in mind kind of the prototypical pictorial representation. And we will come back to this equation many times. So I did mention that I would review some of the more physical derivations of this equation, so I will touch upon those pretty quickly. If you look at a differential element, kind of similar to what we had previously with the Taylor series analysis, but we're not going to use the Taylor series analysis, and you have your z hat, y hat, and x hat, and you have the center point of your cube right here, where that is dx over 2, dy over 2, dz over 2, where this is dy, this is dz, and this is dx. And you said to yourself, if I wanted to find a representative derivative of my pressure with respect to any one of my coordinate axes, where in my cube would I look? Well, reasonably, you would look at the center point. So if you found dp dx at the center point, dp dy at the center point, or dp dz at the center point, you could reasonably say, the dp dx, dp dy, or dp dz at my center point is approximately equal to the dp dx, dp dy, or dp dz at this point, or this point, or this point, or this point, or any other point in my cube because it is differential in size. So if you assume that the center point offers a representative rate of change for your pressure, you will very quickly, when doing a force balance, come to the same equations that we yielded after we simplified our Taylor series. That reasoning will kind of short circuit the Taylor series and get you the same result as the Taylor series without actually having to write out the Taylor series. And the equations that you'll end up writing are using this more physical reasoning, negative dy, dp, dy, and then you'll have your integrals very similar to how we had them previously, and you'll get that for y, x, and z. So that kind of more physical reasoning, again, kind of short circuits the Taylor series, skips ahead, and gets the same results as the Taylor series without having to do all that math. So a much more physical derivation of this equation could be yielded by doing a force balance on a finite volume. And what I mean by that is, if we look at the case where we have a free surface of fluid right here, and we have a point of interest that we care about, let's say that's a distance h from the free surface, and above that point that we care about, we have a column of fluid, right? We have a column of fluid, let's say it's water, let's say this is somewhere in, in a still lake, and here you have atmospheric pressure, we'll just call that pressure P naught, and here you have some pressure that you care about, you don't know what it is, we'll just call it P, right? If you write a force balance on this finite volume, what you end up getting is this. So you'll have, say this is positive Z at the free surface, you'll have the sum of the forces in Z on that column is equal to P A minus P naught A minus the weight of that fluid column, which is what? Which is rho V G. And we know that this is fluid statics, so this is all equal to zero. So what we can say then is P minus P naught times A is equal to rho g v. Well, what is v? We're kind of idealizing this as a rectangular column. So we could say that's rho g h times a. So you have p minus p naught a equals rho g h a. a cancels on both sides. And what do you have? p minus p naught is equal to rho g h or P is equal to P naught plus rho G H. Now I know you're probably looking at this and saying, why did we go through all of this formalism with the Taylor series to get the same result as what took us effectively 30 seconds with this Newtonian finite analysis here? And the answer is the mathematical formalism and the mathematical tools that we used to derive this equation through the Taylor series and the integral and differential calculus arguments are incredibly invaluable in deriving future equations, some might say more complicated equations, 
where our physical intuition may partially or fully fail us. And we're going to have to heavily rely on that formalism to not only guide our intuition, but build our intuition. So there are many equations in transport phenomena in heat, energy, and momentum transport where physical intuition will not get us very far. And we really have to heavily rely on these mathematical tools to get us to the finish line. So this is a great proven ground to get ourselves familiar with those tools, to get ourselves comfortable with the arguments that we make using those tools, such that when we get to those more complex equations, we're ready to go. But regardless, in this case, the result derived from our physical intuition exactly matches the result derived from our mathematical analysis. And that's why we have such high confidence in this result. Because when your physical intuition matches with your mathematical intuition, so to speak, that's when you know you're at the intersection of something really powerful. Okay? So that should be it for this video. I really appreciate it. In future videos, we're going to be using this equation a lot to analyze sphygmo manometers, YouTube manometers, compound manometers, and some forces on submerged objects, etc. But that will be for future videos. Thank you very much for sticking around. I appreciate you watching, and I will see you next time.